In this video, we're going to take a look at sketch modification. So here I have the sketch modification.ipt from our working files directory. I'm going to go ahead and activate the sketch by double clicking on it in my model tree over here. Now that it's active, I'm back into my sketch tab, and we're going to be looking at these modified tools in here. So we have tools such as move, copy, rotate, trim, extend, stretch, scale, split, offset. And if you're coming from a 2D vector-based world, you're probably starting to feel warm and fuzzy. Uh, I recognize those tools. Even the icons look similar to what I'm used to. Well, they are not used as often in a parametric system. And I'll explain a couple reasons why. For instance, in a 2D vector system, you might use move a lot to get stuff around. But with Inventor, we use dimensions to push things around. So if I want to move this up to and over to, I can simply change this 15 to 17 and this 17 to 19 and that adjusts it for me. So why would I need to use the move tool? Well, let's imagine I have a reference point. In fact, let me actually use a point command here and just drop this point in space here randomly. Let's imagine that this point was referenced from another file, another assembled part file that we had put together. I need to move this little shape I have onto that point. Well, I don't know exactly what that is. Maybe it's some weird decimal value, but I just know it has to be there. I'm going to use my move command. I'm going to select my geometry. I'm going to pick my base point. I'll choose the center of this guy here. And I'm going to get some messages saying, hey, you know what? You have dimensions on here, and they're going to restrict this movement. So would you like me to relax those dimensions? You know, I'm going to say yes. If I said no, it would stop the command. So yeah, I understand. I'm going to have to relax my dimensions. And I want to put this up onto that point there. So. You can see that if I had to type that in or had to figure that out manually, it might be rather difficult to do. Now, based on these decimal point values, I might have to re-examine my design to make sure things are lining up correctly or to make sure that my machine can cut that tolerance. But in the end, I got the goal. I got this shape onto that point. If I wanted to erase these dimensions and put new ones on to a different locational reference, I could do that now. But for this point, I would use the move command to do exactly what I wanted to do. All right, let me undo that. Next up is copy. So copy looks very similar to move. I do highlight my geometry here to select it. I do pick a base point right here, and then I start placing in additional copies of this. And this is not the same as you know a rectangular pattern or a circular pattern. It's very much irregular. I can place these wherever I want, and it gives me a duplication of that geometry and those dimensions that went into it. Now, some of these options on move and copy you notice you can copy to the clipboard. There's a precise input. That's if you know the X and Y changes. The optimize for a single selection. That just means you don't have to keep coming up here and toggling your buttons over. So let me do this again with optimize for single selection turned on. I'll highlight this. I automatically flipped over to this button. I didn't have to come up here and click on it. So that's basically all that does. Now once these are copied, I can do whatever I want to them. They are their own different elements. So maybe I might want to rotate this one here. So I'll choose Rotate. I'll select my geometry. I'll pick my center point. Again, it would be nice if I had Optimize for a single selection turned on here, wouldn't it? So I want to keep coming up here and clicking things. So I'll select center point. I want this to be my center point here. And I get a message. You got geometry that has geometric constraints on it. Would you like those constraints to be removed? Now, again, you have to say yes in order to continue through this command. However, once you're done, you're going to have to repair certain things. So we can take a look at this when we deal more with sketching constraints, but for right now, understand that it's going to have to remove something, some sort of intelligence you had there to keep it in its current position. So let me rotate this. And there I have it. 24 and 8 still. It's just rotated now. With the scale command, I can select geometry to scale. Base point. Dimensions that need to be relaxed. Yes, I understand that, so I'll choose yes. I can scale it up by a factor of, let's say, 1.25. And I'll scale up my dimensions based on that as well. Typically, I don't use scale unless it's a really complex type of gasket shape or has a lot of curvature involved in it. For just these two values, I could have easily just came in here and either changed them to the correct value or multiplied them by a factor. But if I had 15 or 30 different values that need to all be scaled up or down, I might use scale more often. 
What you should not use scale for is if you incorrectly started a English part and you wanted a metric part or a metric part and you need to go to English. To be quite frank, if you made that much of a mistake when you first started the file, please just start over. Because Inventor is unit aware. It understands the difference between millimeters and inches. So if you were to change your unit type to inches, it doesn't automatically understand that that's now a size of inches. Okay, you do have to change the size of the part. But don't use scale for it. The stretch command, I can tell you right now, I almost never use this. Because if I have loose geometry, I can stretch it as much as I want anyway. I don't really need a command to do it. But this gives you a little bit more control about how you might stretch. And just like with a similar 2D vector system, the way you stretch with this is you have to do a crossing window. So if I cross window over this, this is our right to left window, anything that's fully inside of it, like that arc, will be moved. But the two lines that are partially inside of that crossing window will be stretched. I'll choose my base point. Yep, I have dimensions. I understand that. Yes, I know I have geometric constraints. I have to remove those. So yes. You can see I'm able to stretch it now. The arc is not changing size. It's only changing position. But the lines are changing size. So there's my relaxed dimensions. Now the offset command. I use this one quite a bit. So if I were to choose offset, let's go down here to this guy and zoom into it. I can offset the entire loop. This is the default. I select it. I place it either inside or outside the loop. But it never asked me for an amount. So with this offset command, you first offset the geometry where you want it to go. And then you have to come back and you have to add a dimension to it. So I want this to be, you know, five all the way around. Let me undo these a little bit. Let me just back up. All right, so back to offset. If I right click while I'm inside this command, I can choose different options to toggle either loop select on or off or constraint offset on and off. If I turn loop select off, that's going to grab one line at a time. I would have to control or shift select to get multiple lines. So let me turn off loop select. And I can select these two lines. Right click and say continue. That's what a lot of people miss when they turn loop select off. They do have to right click and say continue, which way you would like to offset this. And then you can go back and you still put the value in. Now, what the option of constrained offset does, okay, so let me back this up. Let me turn my loop select back on, but I'll turn constrained offset off. Here I'll still grab the loop and offset it out, but since they are not constrained to be the same all the way around, I can make this two on here and make this six out here. Geometrically, it stays the same. You know, it's still tangent here. It's still got that line tangent to it here and here. So the six all the way around here has to maintain, but this two over here can be anything at once now. On the previous example, when I did this, if I chose five, it's five all the way around. Let me just throw a line through here. and take a look at this next command called split. Split is very similar to like other programs break at point commands. So with the split tool, I basically hover on an object I would like to split. In this case, I'm splitting the line where the red X is. If I hover on the curve, I'm splitting the curve where the red X is. Where might you need to do this? Well, if you're doing a complex sweep geometry, you might have to break your profiles up so they can be created as separate profiles. Or maybe one part of this curve, you just want to be a construction line. So you can toggle that to a construction line. But it gives you a little bit more versatility to break your geometry up without having to recreate portions of it. If I split that, you can see I have split that curve at that location. If I move this line around, those constraints still hold. So the line is still split based on that line. All right, so let's take a look at trim and extend next. These are two very commonly used commands. A lot of people use these in vector-based systems. I don't traditionally use them a lot in a parametric inventor system, though. There's times where I do use them, don't get me wrong, but just not as often as what I would do inside of like a 2D world only. So let me go up here and use trim first. And this basically allows me to trim to the next available segment. You will see when I hover on this, it highlights it being trimmed back to a certain point. So if I were to hover on here, you see that highlighted being trimmed. If I hover on here, you see that highlighted for where it's gonna trim. So let me trim off this piece here. And I can also trim off this piece here to get just that line segment in the middle. Now if I do extend, you can see it's going to extend it to the next available reference. 
Again, these are previews. It doesn't actually extend it until you click it. So now it's extended out. These are still controlled through geometric constraints. Now with trim and extend, we also have the ability to do dynamic trimming and extending. What that is, is if I click and hold down and drag my mouse around, you see this kind of blue line trail that's coming out behind my cursor. So while you're in the command, by clicking and holding, this happens. And then as I cross over items, they automatically will start trimming themselves. So this is a dynamic trim. It can really help you go through and clean up a lot of messy geometry and it just keeps doing trims without you having to click all the time. Now, by doing that, I cause a lot of problems. So let me hit cancel there. Let me just do a trim and I'll just dynamically trim across these two. And that worked out okay. The same thing with extension. If you click and hold it, you can extend dynamically depending on what you cross over. So just be careful what you're crossing over because now I've extended something too far. So you gotta be really quick with the mouse and really handy with how you move it around if you are gonna use these tools, especially with that dynamic function. So that's a look at the sketch modification tools inside of Autodesk Inventor. We had move, copy, rotate, trim, extend, split, scale, stretch, and offset. Commands that look really inviting, but realistically aren't really that utilized is what you might think inside of a CAD system. With Inventor being such a parametric based model where you can create equations and have dimensions push your geometry, these aren't used as often as somewhat new users would think. So, you know, don't try to overuse them is what I would say, but just know that they're there. I would say the most commonly used ones in that group there are some of the ones I mentioned like offset. I use that quite a bit. Move under certain conditions. Even trim and extend, I still use quite a bit. The other ones are kind of there if you make me feel a little bit more warm and fuzzy about where I might be coming from in another CAD system, though.